we start seeing more come back in, we will join together in uh, allowing that process again as needed. So uh, if you have just joined us online, uh, you didn't hear what we were saying there for a moment, we welcome you. We're delighted that you have joined us, joining those who are on campus here today as we worship our Lord Christ. Uh, this has been an interesting week. And uh, today, God has impressed on me to bring a message that I initially entitled a message to the nation. And as I reflect on it, it's not a message to a nation. It's a, ref it's a message to a church in a nation. And so today, we will turn our attention to 1 Timothy chapter 2 in just a few moments and listen as God speaks to us there. This morning, I want to invite you to pray for our associate pastor, Mark, as he was on his way in this morning. He got a call, and you're aware that he's a hospice chaplain, got a call of one of their patients who is passing and requesting last rites. And so Mark is working right now to try to find a priest uh, to get to that situation. And you can imagine on a Sunday morning, that's a challenge uh, to be able to find someone. And so remember him in prayer this morning as he is ministering to a family and understanding himself that he is not in the tradition of their experience and so trying to minister effectively and uh, not always an easy thing to do. And so we invite you to pray for Mark this morning. Let me share with you, if you're here as our guest today, our joy at just seeing you join us in worship we pray that in the time that we spend together, you will experience the very presence of God. And so we thank you for joining us. We would love to know a little bit more about you on our website, grandviewbc.org. There is a place for guest information, registration, or you can text the number on the screen now and just simply use that as a means of saying, hey, here's who I am. And I'm joining you today. Now that's whether you're here with us on campus or whether you're online and joining us. We invite you just to simply say, you know, I live in Tyler and uh, my name is Bob and I'm joining you in worship today. And we just welcome you and would like to know that. Uh, this week, there are a couple of things that I want you to be aware of that are taking place. First of all, please be praying. Our leadership team has been meeting and discussing bringing children back in to our campus now, preschoolers and children, not to begin a Bible study hour, but to care for them during the worship experience. And so pray that we will have good sense of leadership and doing that effectively as we seek God's leadership in that. We have families for whom it's very difficult. If you have six kids, for instance, and they're all uh, you know small tykes, you come into the worship experience and you try to corral them all. You feel like all you did in the whole worship time is corral kids. And so sometimes it's easier to stay home and enjoy worship that way. But we want to uh, not only uh, provide the opportunity for the family, but for the children to fellowship with other children and to enjoy together uh, learning about the love of Jesus. So pray for us in that. Second thing, this morning we have our deacons meeting Monday night, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. They'll be meeting uh, virtually by Zoom. Deacons have that information, but would you be praying for them as they meet tomorrow evening, those who serve in an elder role in our congregation, helping to cast vision and to secure direction for us. We're in the season of Operation Christmas Child. Many of you have already taken boxes. The collection day is next Sunday, so you have one week remaining to fill that box that you have uh, uh, taken. And if you have not yet taken a box and you think there's no way I can get that done between now and next season, uh, next Sunday, on our website now, you will find a link to where you can let Samaritan's Purse fill a box for you so that you can still participate without filling the box yourself. They will build the box. You simply provide the financial means to enable that, and you still have an opportunity to touch a child. 
After this video, Brother Josh comes to lead us as our praise team guides us in worship. We lift our voices together, but you begin by praying for Operation Christmas Child and watch this word. Mm. Finally. Peace and quiet. Peace and quiet. Now let's pack those Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. If you're like me, it can be difficult to know where to start. To make things easier, just start with a box. Any average size cardboard or plastic box will work, but I find a shoe box works best. After that, you'll need to decide what age group you're going to pack for, and if it's for a boy or a girl. Now let's fill that shoe box. It's best to start by selecting a wow item, something like a soccer ball and a pump, or a stuffed animal, something that's really special. Yes and yes. Once you've got your wow item, you can start to fill it with other fun stuff, like toys, clothes, sandals, or even school supplies. <laughs> what do you mean, however? However, there are some items you don't want to include. Things like gum, toothpaste, items related to war, liquids. But for a complete list, check out the website. Oh boy, I think they're going to like this. While a shoebox might seem small and simple, it can mean the world to a child who may have never received a gift. It shows God's love in a tangible way to children in need, and together with the local church worldwide, shares the good news of Jesus Christ. This is why you will also want to personalize your shoebox. Even including a letter or a photo of your family or yourself can make it extra special to the child. The most powerful thing you can do is pray. Pray that your gift will make an impact. That both the child and the community will discover the love and name of Jesus. <laughs> when your box is finished, you can make your $9 donation online or by mailing in your contribution using the business reply envelope in the brochure. This donation is critical for training and equipping local churches to share the gospel, along with the collection, processing, and shipping of the shoebox gifts. And don't forget to activate a label so you can follow your box and discover its final destination. Finally, make sure to check the website for the closest drop-off location near you. And make sure to mark the date for the third week in November as National Collection Week. Well, there you go. You just packed yourself a shoebox. <laughs> Grandma. Already done. What? How? I thought she wasn't going to stores right now. She isn't. She packed her box online. That's right, Dad. With just a few clicks of a mouse, Grandma packed her whole shoe box online. She can choose from all kinds of gifts, even make it personal by adding a letter and a photo. Wow. So she doesn't even need to leave the house? Nope. She can stay safe inside and still have time for Doomcraft. Talking complete. Good morning, church. Let's just worship the Lord this morning. Amen. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us, Lord. You lead us by still waters and to mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember, so remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is in your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Great is your love and justice. Great is your love and justice, God of Jacob. The weak to lead the strong. Who 
lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember, so remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace, your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace. Fortress is our God, a bulwark never fails. Our Helper, He amid the flood of mortal ills prevails. Still our ancient foe Does seek to work us woe His craft and our heart break And our with cruel hate On earth is not His We in our own strength confide Our striving will be losing We're not the right man on our side The man of God's own choosing Does as to that may be Christ Jesus it is He Lord, saddle off his name from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God has with his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little world shall fail. Fortress, a mighty fortress is our God. A mighty fortress, a mighty fortress is our God. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them above. gifts are ours through him who with us sighed let good and kindred go this mortal life also the body they may kill God's truth abide in sin his kingdom is forever 
salvation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus hath fled? Fear not, fear not, I am with thee, O be not dismayed, for I am your God and will still give thee aid. Strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. Went through, went through fiery trials, thy pathway shall lie. My grace, all sufficient, shall be thy supply. Oh, 
Just let that simmer for just a moment. <laughs> Come on up here, buddy. Come on up here. Forever he is alive. Y'all can scoot up a little bit if you want. Right in front of that light. He, that's perfect. Right in front of the light. You got it right. <laughs> Forever he's glorified. If you're one of our kids here today, we're so glad you're here. If you're one of our kids watching at home, thank you for joining us today. Depending on how old you are, you've probably been to a sleepover at a friend's house. Or maybe a friend's come to spend the night with you. You hung out, you ate food, maybe some pizza, you had some fun, and then you went home and you told your mom and dad all about it. But we're going to talk today about a sleepover that wasn't nearly as much fun. One that was a little bit scary. And one that we didn't know was going to happen. So let's talk about Daniel and the scary sleepover. Things were not looking good for God's people. They had been captured, taken far from home. And now they were slaves of the king of Babylon. But God hadn't left his people. He was with them, and he was looking after them. Daniel loved God and obeyed him. Now, see, God made David able to understand lots of difficult things. So it wasn't long before the king of Babylon noticed him. And see, King Darius, the king of Babylon, liked how clever Daniel was. So he made Daniel one of the most important helpers of all. And he put Daniel in charge of a lot of other helpers. But some of the other helpers didn't like this at all. They wanted the king to like them best. And they wanted to get rid of Daniel. So they spied on him. They tried to find things wrong with Daniel. Things they could tell the king and say, look how bad he was. Things they could, but there weren't any. None. They couldn't find anything at all. Except there was just this one thing. Every day, three times a day, Without fail, no matter what, Daniel went to his room, closed the door, and he prayed. And they smiled to themselves. Let's get the king to make a law. No one is allowed to pray to anyone except the king. 
Daniel won't obey this law, and he will be punished. They were pleased with themselves for being so clever, and they hurried off to tell the king. And the king, he liked that idea. He didn't know they were tricking him. So he made it into a law. Everyone must pray only to me. If you don't, the lions will have you for dinner. Daniel heard this, and he knew it was wrong to pray to anyone except God. He had to do what God said, whatever it cost him, even if it meant that he would die. So Daniel went to his room, he closed the door, and he prayed. And that's just what the bad men knew Daniel would do. They skipped straight off to tell the king, Oh, your most glittering highness, your law says, does it not? that everyone must pray to you. Yes, said the king. Oh, magisterial brightness, then correct us if we're wrong. But it would seem that Daniel is praying to God, not to you. And the king was sad. He'd been tricked. He didn't want to hurt Daniel, but he couldn't change his law. And so he let the soldiers throw Daniel to the lions and said, May your king, whom you love so much, rescue you. And there's Daniel getting thrown right into the lion's den. Yeah. The king went back to his palace. He didn't sleep that night. Not a wink. He tossed and he turned until finally the first glimmer of dawn. He leapt out of bed, ran straight to the den. Daniel, he cried, has your God rescued you? Yes, Daniel shouted. God sent an angel to close the mouths of the lions. And there, resting his head on Daniel's lap, was the biggest lion purring like a little kitten. The king brought Daniel's out of the den. Look, he said, Daniel doesn't even have a scratch. The king made a new law. Daniel's God is the true God. The God who rescues, pray to him instead. And God would keep on rescuing his people. And the time was coming when God would send another brave hero. Like Daniel, who would love God and do what God said, whatever it cost him, even if it meant that he would die. And together they would pull off the greatest rescue the world has ever known. It wasn't fair for Daniel. And it wasn't fair for the king. Bad people did bad things. And Daniel could have been hurt. But God protected him. So if you're at home and wondering who's going to protect me, if you're being bullied... If you're not sure what's going on, pray to God. And my prayer for you is that the God who you love will rescue you as well. Thank you. What a great story. What a great story. What a great God. And... Uh, 
if we had sought a single story that would parallel or complement where God moved the pastor's heart to bring a message for us today, we couldn't have turned to a better story. I am not naive. I know that for many of you, you come just so you can hear the children's story. And so God has this unique way of, of letting what he wants to say be said two times so that you can get it right. Uh, today, a message for our church, a message for a church in a nation. Years ago, when we were still pastoring that first church that we pastored in the Metroplex Meadowbrook in Irving, a mother reported to me later what her little girl said to her as they were coming out of Sunday school. She said, Mother, now we're going to the worship circus, right? Now let me repeat that for you. Now we're going to the worship circus, right? And I felt that it's what it's been that way sometimes, haven't you? Uh, not the worship service, but the worship circus. And that's how she had heard it, and so that's how she said it. It's like that little boy who loved to sing that song about gladly that, that bear, gladly that cross-eyed bear, you know. And, and, and there are all kinds of little things like that that kids say. I remember knocking on a door one time and visitation, and a little boy turned and he yelled, Mom! It's the creature, because there they often referred to you as the preacher, you know, it was the creature. Well, I have felt over the last weeks, perhaps you have as well, that it's been more like a circus than anything else in our social structure, our society. Geopolitical analyst George Friedman reports that anger and animosity have always been part of American elections. He argues that loathing candidates is normal and even healthy, according to him, in a liberal democracy, as it demonstrates passion and commitment to our political process. However, Friedman states, beginning in 2020, Supporters of one candidate began to despise the supporters of the other candidate with visceral kind of rage. As a result, each camp has come to see the other as contemptible and each is seen as morally depraved, each shunned by the other. And consequently, uh, when election results are known, Friedman wrote, a vast part of America will continue to loathe another vast part of America. To me, what is frightening, he said, is that this time it won't go away. It has in the past, but I don't think it was like this in the past. This week, as I work internationally, I had seven different leaders from nations where when you read about their political elections, you know you're going to read about depravity. You know you're going to read about decadence. You know you're going to read about those who would love to have a democracy and who realize they don't. And it doesn't matter what the votes may be, this person in power will still, quote, be elected. Seven different nations' leaders communicated they were praying for us this week from nations like that. Uh, there is the potential that we bruise a, dem a democratic process that is a gift from God. Friedman said that some things happened in this election cycle that have not happened before. But his greatest fear is the impact of those will not simply wash away after election day, but that they will continue. Do you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 how God said that he is not the author of confusion? 
chaos and godliness are mutually exclusive. He said, let all things be done decently and in order. Paul wrote one of his letters to Timothy providing guidance about how the church should be ordered for service rather than acting like a circus. In light of our national status, I want us to hear God speak to us from 1 Timothy chapter 2 this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. For kings and all who are in authority, in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God... And one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony born at the proper time. And for this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. I am aware. I have heard from those this week who are deliriously delighted. I have heard from those who are darkly, darkly in pain. I want us to hear what God would say subsequent to an election to his church. I'm going to ask you in just a moment if you really believe some things. And then we're going to just simply quickly walk through five truths out of our text as we listen to God speak to his church in light of what's taken place in our land. So, Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you, first of all, that you have not stepped off the throne. That last Sunday you were on the throne, and that this Sunday that throne has not been abdicated. You are still Lord of Lords, King of Kings. You are still ruling. You are still the one who raises up and who deposes. You are still the one who places kings on thrones and removes them from thrones. You are the God of the living. So this day we come to you and we say, Holy Father... Uh, In our nation, there has been vitriol, there has been animosity, there has been uh, verbal attack one to the other. There has been all kind of activity that do not have anything at all to do with the appearance of godliness and righteousness and love and grace and mercy and peace. And we thank you that while you have enabled us to be a part of this nation, citizens of this domain, citizens of this nation, this kingdom, we thank you, Father, that our citizenship is yet laid up elsewhere. For we are citizens of your kingdom, the kingdom of God, and we are but aliens here, strangers here. We are here as demonstration plots so that those around us may experience the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and see the difference that he makes daily in lives. Father, we are the custodians of the reputation of Jesus in this world. As those who claim the name of Christ, people will look at us and they will see our behavior and assume that that behavior reflects Jesus himself. May our actions actually reflect Jesus. Our King is our prayer. Speak to us, God, today. Speak to us directly today that which we need to hear. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. So the text is this. You follow along one more time. We've already read it, but I want you to hear the Word of God again before we get into it. Therefore, first of all then, 
I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgivings may be made on behalf of all men. Now understand, there are four different words for prayer there. And we could spend an entire message, in fact, we could do a series of messages just on those four different words for prayer that are there. We're not even going to take time to look at those. We're just going to lump them together and hear the Father saying to us that we are to pray for all men. He goes on to say, for kings and for all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Uh, one of those speaks to what is going on in the circumstances around us, that there may be tranquility, that there may be peace in the culture around us. The second is what's going on inside of us without regard to what's taking place in the culture around us, that inside of us there is a quiet spirit, a peace that comes from knowing the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and that He is still on the throne. And then he says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. God says, look, when you pray for people, this is good. This is what God accepts from you. It's what he expects and accepts from you. Who desires all men to be saved. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now understand, in the context of the church at Ephesus where Timothy was there at the direction of Paul overseeing, guiding this church in Ephesus. There, there would have been a whole host of people who were given to a, a bent to, called Gnosticism. And a part of that would, would be this, that Jesus Christ is not God himself. Jesus is an emanation from God. There is a series of those and he's one of those and is removed from God. And, and we don't really have a way to get to God. And the Apostle Paul is saying, whoa, wait just a minute. Not only is Jesus God himself, he is the only mediator between man and God. And that is the role that Christ has come so that all men can have access to God. And that's what Jesus did. And he goes on to say then that he gave himself as a ransom for all. It was this word from God given at a proper time. This testimony given at the right moment. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. And I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And therefore... I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Do you believe, first of all, today, Tuesday was an election day, some are dismayed, some are delighted. Do you believe that God is still there? I mean, do you really believe that God is still in our nation, that God is still on the throne, that God is still there? Do you remember Psalm 139? We often quote Psalm 139 for that, that portion that talks about how he knew us before we were even, even created in the womb. But just prior to that, in Psalm 139, listen to these words. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of dawn, if I dwell in the remotest parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely this darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day darkness and light are alike to you do you believe that God is still there that God is still on the throne that there is no place that you and I can go that God is not there providence is not surprised by human events he's already there he is there. Do you believe God is already there and is still there and will be there tomorrow morning? Is he really the God who understands, the God who sees? Is he really the God who is the God of providence? Is he really the God on the throne? Is God there? And then secondly, I want to ask you, do you believe that God is accomplishing his purposes? 
Oh, do you? Do you believe God is accomplishing His purposes? He guides through the darkness. He calms the storms. He brings His to safety. He exalts righteousness. He humbles the proud. Our failures do not thwart His purposes. In the book of Isaiah, there is a beautiful, beautiful word. In Isaiah chapter 46, Isaiah 46, verses 9, 10, and 11b. Remember... Remember the former things long past, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established. I will accomplish my good pleasure Truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it, surely I will do it. We sometimes think that we can thwart the purposes and plan of God. But brothers and sisters, this morning God says He has a plan and He will accomplish His purpose. We cannot thwart the plan of God. It doesn't matter whether you're one of the delight camp or the dismayed camp. We are in this place where God is still on the throne accomplishing the purposes of God. We better believe that. Do you believe God is there? Do you believe God is accomplishing His purpose? And do you believe that God is inviting our participation? Look, we don't, when you leave here today, some of you are going to go to a restaurant. I know you. And when you get to that restaurant, you may think, well, when I get there, I'll bring Jesus with me. No, no, no. You don't bring Jesus. God's already there before you get there. He is already in that place before you and I ever get. We don't bring God, we join God. And in that context, the first order that He gave to us in joining Him is what He said here in this text. That first word, he said, the first thing I say to you, the first word, first of all then, I urge prayer. First of all then, I urge prayer. He tells us to pray, number one, for all who are in authority. This passage distinctly commands prayers for kings and emperors and all who are set in authority. This is a moment today when we pray for President-elect Biden. We pray for Vice President-elect Harris. If you are going to say, well, wait until it's completely resolved, okay. We still have the responsibility to pray for those who are set in authority. That's what the text of God's Word tells us. This passage distinctly commands us pray for kings and emperors and all who are set in authority. It was a cardinal principle of communal Christian prayer. Emperors might be persecutors and those in authority might be determined to stamp out Christianity itself. But the Christian church never, even in times of its bitterest persecution, ceased to pray for them. Let me just share with you the, the, the word from Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2. Fear God, honor the emperor. And we must remember that the emperor was none other than the Nero, that monster of cruelty. <laughs> Tertullian, one of the fathers of the church, insists that for the, for the emperor, the Christian pray these things. Pray for long life. Secure dominion, a safe home, a faithful senate, a righteous people, a world at peace. He writes, the Christian is enemy of no man, least of all of the emperor. For we know that since he has been appointed by God, it is necessary that we should love him and reverence him and honor him and desire his safety together with that of the whole Roman Empire. Therefore, we sacrifice for the safety of the emperor. This is a Christian forefather writing about praying for the very one who is trying to stamp out the church of which that one is a part. Oh, brothers and sisters, uh, we don't have any enemies. Uh, we are those called to embrace a world that Jesus loves with our prayer. Pray for those in authority. The second thing that he says to us is that we are to pray with his desire. 
And what is God's desire? His desire is that all men should be saved. This is, this is what he says. He, God desires that all men should be saved in the fourth verse and come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, did you hear that? How many men does God want to see saved? All men. God desires that all men would be saved. Now, that is not all without exception. That doesn't mean that because God wants everybody to be saved, everybody will be saved. It doesn't mean all without exception are going to be saved, so we don't even have to be concerned. Everybody gets to heaven. Everybody makes it. No, it means not all without exception, but all, all without distinction. Republican, Democrat, rich, poor, Jew, Gentile, in, out, sad, glad. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. God is desiring that out of every segment of society, out of every nation of the earth, out of every tribe, out of every tongue, out of every people group, He longs to see those who come to know Him as Lord and Savior. God's desire and we pray for those to come to know Jesus Christ who do not know Him. Pray for those in authority. Pray with a desire that all men may be saved. He goes on to say, pray rejoicing that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is a ransom sufficient for all. Uh, Do you really believe that? That what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago is sufficient for the salvation of, of the most heinous criminal in our culture today? Do you really believe that that one who is just immoral as can possibly be, that the, what was done on the cross 2,000 years ago is still sufficient to change that one today? I believe that. I believe that the power of God is still sufficient. Understand the ransom that was paid, the price of that ransom, the very blood of the very Son of God Himself, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That ransom payment for our sin debt was sufficient for all. But it is efficient for only those who call. Sufficient for all, but efficient only for those who will call upon the name of the Lord. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So it's sufficient for everybody and efficient for those who will receive this gift of grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray for all men. We pray for those in authority. We pray for the salvation of souls. We pray rejoicing that the ransom of Jesus Christ is sufficient for all men for all time to secure all for eternity. And fourth, we are to pray with lifting up holy hands. Now, uh, you understand, we tend when we pray to bow our heads and close our eyes. That's not the posture that was the posture of the, the Jew as a normal experience. They would lift their head up their eyes to heaven and lift their hands up as though they are receiving a very gift from God. It's an acknowledgement that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Somebody might say those Jews all those years were praying with their arms so that it looked like they would see that when Jesus stretched out His arms on the cross that they might see the very image of what they had experienced for years. The the Apostle Paul says that we are to pray lifting holy hands, clean hands. Do you remember Psalm 24, 4? Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He will ascend. He will ascend. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. When the apostle says lifting up holy hands, he is talking about you and I have recognized our own sin, have found salvation through Jesus Christ, and now are in the process of being conformed into His image, seeking to be holy ones in this world. It is never a posture of arrogance, but always a posture of humility. God, except for Your grace, I would be lost Except for your mercy, I would be doomed to an eternity separated from you. There is nothing good in me that merited the goodness of Christ and grace and mercy. It is all of you. And I am humbled to be the recipient of your grace, mercy, and love. 
We are instructed to pray for all men, to pray for those in authority. We are instructed to pray the personal prayer of the desire of God that all men be saved. We are to pray rejoicing in the sufficiency of what Jesus did at the cross of being effective for those who will call on Him today and tomorrow and for all time and throughout eternity. We are to pray with hearts that are pure before God, recognizing that only by His grace are we changed. And we are to pray without anger or dissension. That's an interesting last verse. I want men in every place to pray the 8th verse, 2nd chapter, 1st Timothy. Therefore, I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Anger, orge, is the word in the original language that's used. Anger. Vitriol, cutting people down, words that fly out that seek to hurt and harm and inflict wounds. The apostle said we're to pray without any of that kind of attitude. Dissension is an interesting word there. If some of you are reading the the King James text, the old King James 1611 text, it says without doubting. And probably what it means is this. There are some who heard God say, you have to pray for kings. You have to pray for your enemies. You have to pray for the ruler, even if you don't think the ruler is the right ruler. You have to pray for them, even if they're persecuting. You have to pray for them, even if they are threatening the very existence of Christianity and the church itself. You have to pray for them. Now, you could say, well, okay, I'll pray for them, but I don't really believe God will change them. That's the without doubting in that text. That when you and I obey God's command and pray, we're not just obeying God's command and prayer, we're praying with an absolute confidence in the power, capacity, and longing of God to answer that prayer for the salvation, to answer that prayer for the transformation, to answer that prayer that even our enemies are brought into the fold of God. We are to pray with absolute confidence in the power and desire and the capacity of God to answer that prayer in the affirmative. Brothers and sisters, we cannot be right with God and wrong with each other. To be, to, to, to be bitter with a man is to erect a barrier between us and God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 35, we are to forgive from the heart. This week Jim Dennison wrote, we must create a culture of encounter and hospitality. A culture in which we become busy, even obsessed with the needs of the other, especially our vulnerable neighbor in a personal embodied context. While Americans fight with each other over the election and its results, let's be people who are too busy loving to hate, too busy serving to slander, too busy caring for our neighbors to harm our neighbors. During the campaign, Americans were often told to vote like your life depends on it. Now Americans must love like our democracy depends upon it. Because it does. The process of rebuilding our national civility starts today. And frankly, it rests on us. It's the church's task. To model acceptance, graciousness, inclusion, love. We who have been loved when we should never have been must be those who love unconditionally. For a long time, I've admired Corey Ten Boom. Some of you would recognize the name of that sainted missionary of God single in her years and serving Jesus. I remember reading Corey Ten Boom's statement, when a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and you trust the engineer. I don't know where you are today. 
It may seem to you that we are in a nation that is divided and darkened right now. But I want to say to you, church, trust the engineer. Trust the engineer. Father God, we thank you this morning that you are the engineer, the architect, that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we thank you that what has transpired this week in our nation is allowed under the sovereign hand of God. You are accomplishing your purpose. We believe that. And so, Father, we this morning pray for those in authority. We pray, Father, for those who do not know you as Lord and Savior. We pray that the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ might penetrate their hearts and their minds. We pray that they will understand the ransom that was given for them on Calvary's cross 2,000 plus years ago. We pray today, Father, that you would forgive us of our own sin where we have been guilty of saying anything we shouldn't have said, of posting anything we shouldn't have posted where we have been guilty, Father, of attitudes that should never have been a part of our experience. We ask you, we cry out to you, forgive us, God. And then as we heard Daniel do last week, as we hear Ezra do, as we hear Nehemiah do, we cry out and we say, God, forgive our nation. Forgive the sin of our people. Forgive us, God, for as a nation we have sinned against you. So, Father, we cry out that we might be a people who can cry to you with holy hands, no one bitterness in our heart toward anyone else. Knowing that our bitterness creates a barrier before you, we forgive others just as we pray you forgive us. And then, Father, we turn and we say, God, would you accomplish your purpose in this generation. Father, some of us this week, if the election results are finalized and we know the outcome, and perhaps even if we don't know with certainty the final word, uh, we need to write a letter. And we need to say, uh, President-elect, Vice President-elect, we want you to know that we are praying for you. We would write a letter to an outgoing president, to an outgoing vice president, and we would say, we want you to know that we are praying for you. Father, our function as the church is to pursue righteousness. And you have told us it begins as we pray. Speak to us, Lord. Let us hear what we need to do. Where there is bitterness, forgive us. Where there is bitterness, let us so love. Father, where we have acted inappropriately, we confess. We seek forgiveness. And we say, Father, as a, un- as a nation, would you unite this people? Would you bring us together under the authority of our Lord God who commanded us as his people to pray for those in authority? We trust you, God. Forgive us when we have acted like you have not been on the throne. Forgive those who have spoken such vitriol against others. And if Friedman was right, Father, that Across the years, that antagonism has been a reflection of a democratic process that works. Let him be wrong in his belief that what has been garnered in 2020 will never be taken away. That hatred and vitriol will continue. That partisan sides will stand opposed to each other and seeing the other as the mortal enemy. Forgive us, Father, if we ever think that anything except our response to Jesus Christ is that which is the evidence of our securing salvation. Father, may we embrace brothers and sisters nonpartisanly as children of the Most High God. May unity prevail, and may it begin in us, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a word to a church and a nation, and I pray that it's a word that God has given to us.
This morning you're here, this morning you're watching, and maybe in the quietness of this moment there are things that God is just kind of stirring in your heart that need to be done right now. That's the entire appeal. Would you simply let God stir and do what He needs to do? And would you say, God, you have your way. You have your way until I reflect who you want me to be to a world around me. Let's sing together. And as we do that, you're in a spirit of prayer. Just remain seated and let's sing these words to the Father. And when before the throne I stand in Him complete Jesus died my soul to save My lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Jesus paid it all Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow he washed it white as snow our deacon of the week comes to lead us in our benediction this morning and as we prepare to pray i encourage you would you be praying this week would you pray for president trump for Vice President Pence, for congressional and Senate leaders, for local governmental officials who have just gone through another electoral process, would you pray for those who are elect to positions? And would you pray that in it all, our God would be exceedingly glorified? Mark, our deacon is not here. Would you come and lead us as we pray? Your continued presence to be felt all over our country in this world. We thank you that you are, you never change. That we can rely and submit our will to your will. That we can say, you are the God of all creation the Lord of all the earth. And as you would give us the opportunity as a church to intercede, Father, impress upon our hearts because of our relationship with Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit, how we might intercede in prayer. And then not only intercede in prayer, but intercede in the action of putting our faith into practice, of writing that letter, of making that phone call, of standing in the gap for the faith that we hold dear. Bless us this week. May we be your light as the people of God. We ask in Christ Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. Go and serve the Father this week. May he bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. God bless you.